Ladies and gentlemen, Richard, thank you very much for this uh, warm welcome. Richard, I have to say that's the nearest thing that I've heard to an obituary for a very, very long time. <laughs> uh, I cannot tell you actually why it is such a very great pleasure for Catherine and me to be here. Um, for me, I'm a kind of half-native son of this city of Bath. I spent my teenage years here, a period which I think was most distinguished by the two months I spent at the chicken factory in Norton St. Philip, <laughs> attempting to earn the money which my parents firmly declined to give me to go swanning in Italy for a year. On a, on a more serious note, though, to be standing in an area where Winston Churchill has himself stood and delivered himself of that speech, the Primrose League, in, in 1897, really does make the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It's a wonderful thing to be here at the, the American Museum in Bath, and I'm honoured that you um, have uh, chosen me to inaugurate this uh, series of lectures um, on Winston Churchill. As a former ambassador of the United States, I can think of few greater honours than to be able to do this tonight. So, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, it would have given my great aunt, my late great aunt, Sheila Minto, the most profound pleasure to have been here this evening. Maybe she is even now sitting on a cloud above the museum looking down. Anyway, it's a kind of fancy that I have that she might be doing this. She was one of the heroic band of garden girls who throughout the Second World War took down in shorthand Churchill's dictation and then typed it up into minutes, uh, letters, and speeches. She was a formidable Scottish woman of implacable respectability and discretion. She was usually summoned to take dictation at night when Churchill was at his most creative. Most of the time, she told me, he was in bed. But apparently, there were occasions when he was in the bath <laughs> and became so consumed by the composition of some piece of high-flown rhetoric that he would rise before her pink and steaming from the waters. <laughs> I was once told by one of her fellow garden girls that Churchill would say, send for Miss Minto. She doesn't mind when I swear. <laughs> My aunt served seven prime ministers from Stanley Baldwin to Harold Wilson. She liked some of them, admired others, despised one of them. But, yes, but for her... <laughs> Churchill towered like a colossus over them all. Personally, I never met Winston Churchill, but from my earliest days, I was steeped in the values and legacy of the great man. Churchill's 18th century ancestor, John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, um, to whom you have just referred, Richard, one of England's greatest generals, was the particular hero of my history master at my preparatory school, Mr. Frith a six-foot-six Ulsterman with a stentorian voice. His special subject was the War of Spanish Succession at the beginning of the 18th century, which pitted England against France, as usual. Um, he would drill us in class before the history exam. Brom, 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 he would roar. And we would have to roar it back. Brom, brom, brom. And this was his way of getting us to remember the Duke's four great victories over the French alliance. B for Blenheim, R for Ramillies, O for Oudenard, and M for Malplaquet. Churchill, of course, wrote a fine biography of the first Marlborough. It should come, therefore, as no surprise that he, fine horseman, skilled polo player, fearless cavalry man, no doubt part of his Iroquois uh, heritage, of which I did not know until you said it this evening, <laughs> should have yearned to emulate his great forebear and see military action. Few may recall, though Hollywood jogged our memories in the film Young Winston some 40 years ago, that Churchill saw action on what is now the northwest frontier between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and more about that in a minute, and in the Sudan, where in 1898, at the age of 24, he took part in the Battle of Omdurman in one of the last cavalry charges of the British Army. 
His exploits in South Africa during the Boer War, the very end of the 20th, uh, 19th century, more as journalist than soldier, were famous. And in the First World War, he served briefly as a battalion commander on the Western Front in 1916. The late Lord Deeds, uh, an editor of the Daily Telegraph, recalled that, and I quote, Churchill was with the Grenadier Guards, who were dry at battalion headquarters, i.e. they weren't allowed alcohol. They very much liked tea and condensed milk, which had no great appeal to Winston. But alcohol was permitted in the front line in the trenches. So he suggested to the colonel that he really ought to see a bit more of the war and get into the front line. <laughs> this was highly commended by the colonel, who thought it a very good thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, there is, in the British ambassador's private office in Washington, a modest black and white photograph uh, that shows Churchill standing on the steps under the portico of Edwin Lutyen's fine embassy building. And he has next to him the ambassador, Lord Halifax, tall, thin, rather stooped. It is sometime during or immediately after the Second World War. And Churchill is addressing a group of embassy staff. And the most remarkable thing about the photo is not Churchill himself, though it is in its way a valuable little piece of history, but the look on the faces of those who are listening to him, rapt, attentive, inspired, trusting, utterly devoted. There you see in a microcosm Churchill's powers of leadership and inspiration. I could more or less work out from the photo where he was standing. And quite often, usually very early in the morning, when I was reading the American newspapers on the terrace with a steaming mug of tea, the sun rising over the grounds, huge birds called turkey vultures strutting over the lawn with squirrels and the odd raccoon navigating between them, I would get up and stand exactly where Churchill had stood some 60 years before. What was I expecting or hoping for? Certainly in the most vivid way possible, a sense of history. And maybe the hope that some atom of his strength and courage would pass to me. Churchill remains a hero to many Americans. In the White House of President George W. Bush, lectures on Churchill as leader were regularly organized. I attended one or two of them. I was struck by, I was struck by how Americans despite having many heroes of their own, would also look to Britain for examples of leadership and inspiration. Now, in Churchill's case, the reason was obvious. But in my first year in Washington, I found myself invited by the United States Marine Corps to celebrate the life and death of Horatio Lord Nelson, the last time I looked, a British admiral. As I sat at an elaborate dinner in the Marine barracks, raising my glass to Nelson and listening to a tribute from the US Secretary of the Navy, I thought to myself, what the hell is going on? <laughs> the Battle of Trafalgar had taken place in 1805, between the War of American Independence and the War of 1812, when Britain and America had fought each other with considerable violence. Yet, Trafalgar was a sea engagement between Nelson and the Franco-Spanish fleet. As they say in Texas, America did not have a dog in the fight. There were no Americans at Trafalgar, at least not officially. But it says something about one of the indefinable qualities of the British-American relationship that such a ceremony could take place, with a dozen American admirals and scores of sailors and marines from the two countries. As Edmund Burke, the great English parliamentarian of the late 18th century, once remarked, England and America are bound by ties as strong as iron, but as light as air. You'll be pleased to hear, incidentally, at least I hope you'll be pleased to hear, that the following year, I succeeded in repatriating the Trafalgar night dinner to the embassy, where it became an annual highlight with a band of the Royal Marines beating retreat on the embassy grounds. 
My wife, who was half French, had always an ambiv ambivalent view of this. <laughs> Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, nowadays, nowadays when presidents and prime ministers go visiting abroad, they will rarely spend more than 36 hours in a country. Sometimes it's just a meal. It is almost a matter of machismo to cram into one trip abroad as many countries, even continents, as you can. But consider this. In the middle of the Second World War, in 1941, the time of Winston's speech at the Joint Session, I must I assume, when things were pretty desperate for Britain, Churchill came to Washington. He stayed for three weeks and spent Christmas with President Roosevelt. More remarkable still was Churchill's visit in 1943. Roosevelt broke off to go to his family home at Hyde Park on the Hudson River in New York State, leaving Churchill alone in the White House, free to conduct meetings with American officials, which he did. It is hard to see President Obama according the same favor to David Cameron or, perish the thought, Ed Miliband. <laughs> I make that in no partisan sense at all. Comment. Churchill's reputation as a wartime leader has overshadowed his talents as an historian and writer. Few now recall that he received a Nobel Prize for Literature. At my preparatory school, if we did well in our history exams, we would be given a volume of Churchill's History of the English-Speaking Peoples. This was intended to nurture our interest in history, and in due course, I acquired all four volumes. But my enthusiasm for history needed no nurturing. It came almost with my mother's milk. At about the age of seven, I was rummaging around in the attic of my grandmother's house. I fell upon a pile of musty books covered in dust, and among them was one of those enormous Victorian tomes, bound in dark red leather, embossed in gold, lavishly illustrated in the pre-Raphaelite uh, fashion that was all the rage in those days. It was a history of the kings and queens of England. It began with Edward the Confessor in 1066, just before the Norman Conquest, and ended with Queen Victoria, who was still alive at the time of its publication. The book was dedicated to the peoples of the British Empire, upon which, and I quote, the sun never sets. And in the 1880s, that was both a geographical and a political statement, reflecting the self-confidence and ideological certainty of the age. I devoured the volume, thrilled by the epic tales of monarchs, good, bad, and ugly. And from that day, day to this, I was hooked on history, and I went on to take a degree in the subject at university. Something then occurred to me after joining the diplomatic service in 1966. History could be useful. The past could guide you through the labyrinths and mazes of the present. It was not for nothing that Prime Minister Harold Macmillan read Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire as he crossed the Atlantic in 1962 to meet President Kennedy and negotiate a deal to acquire American nuclear missiles. To the sensibility of the 21st century, I would suggest, Macmillan's reading material might appear quaint, typical of an age where television was still young and the internet and Twitter beyond the imagination of all but a few visionaries. Well, typical of its age, it certainly was. <clears throat> but quaint, it was not. A thousand years of English history was a major part of the educational curriculum in both state and private schools. It was unthinkable Unthinkable, then, that any British Prime Minister or Foreign Secretary would be ignorant of their nation's history, or that those who represented Britain abroad should know little of the history of the countries in which they defended the British interest. History, I would suggest, not only helps us navigate the president, it is, with science, the only crystal ball we have to peer into the future. Yet today, and for most of a generation, there has been a bias against history in both education and public life. By all accounts, some universities have decided not to teach anything before 1700. So, 
goodbye to Magna Carta, the English Civil War, and the Bill of Rights of 1689. And while we are preaching to the autocracies of the world the virtues of parliamentary democracy, goodbye to the understanding that it took Britain, undisturbed by outside occupation, 713 years to travel from Magna Carta in 1215 to giving women the vote in 1928. What has gone wrong? It's the temper of the times, I think. An almost metaphysical belief in progress and technology, accompanied by a near contempt for those funny people who lived in the past. Good though they may be as fodder for Julian Fellows, uh, or for Hollywood movies like Gladiator. Then there are the modish concepts of the postmodern state, with their contempt for nations and national boundaries most hubristically declaimed from the battered ramparts of the European Union, when it is as plain as a pike staff that the phenomenon of globalization has done nothing to dissolve nationalism and national rivalries. When communism collapsed a generation ago, there were those who declared the end of history. Perhaps the most ill-judged and stupid pronouncement of the late 20th century. As the last two decades have shown, history has returned with a vengeance. In the Balkans, where all manner of deadly irredentisms reemerged as the frozen glaciers of the Cold War melted away, and in the Middle East, where almost a century later, the consequences of the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire after the First World War are playing out with terrible violence in places like Syria and Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, the price of ignoring history can be a nation's blood and a nation's treasure. In Britain, we have lived Two agonies for more than a decade, Afghanistan and Iraq. Afghanistan is still with us until the end of next year when, so David Cameron tells us, we will have withdrawn all of our troops. And I certainly don't want to disinter yet again this evening the arguments for and against intervening in these two countries. But more to examine how the mistakes made in both campaigns might have been avoided if someone at the top of the civilian and military chains of command, had learnt the lessons of the past. If Afghanistan, I beg your pardon, in Afghanistan, for example, we British had no excuse and should have used our close relationship with the United States to spell out what history and Winston Churchill himself had taught us. This is the fourth time in just over 150 years that the British Army has fought a major campaign in Afghanistan. The first three times, twice in the 19th century and once in the 20th, just after the First World War, were all a function of what the Victorians called the Great Game, the strategic rivalry in Asia between Britain and Russia, and Britain's view of Afghanistan as a necessary buffer against Russian expansionism towards Britain's Indian Empire. Now, all this seems so long ago, and it is. The wars spawned a vast number of memoirs, mainly from military men, which now gather dust in obscure libraries. But one stands out for its contemporary relevance and keen powers of observation. It was published in 1898 by a cavalryman turned journalist. His name, Winston Churchill. It is called the Malakand Field Force, based on a series of reports that he filed to the Daily Telegraph in London from the campaign. And it gives an account of a punitive expedition undertaken in 1897 by British forces in India along the northwest frontier between today's Pakistan and Afghanistan against tough Pashtun tribesmen inflamed by Muslim preachers to strike down the foreign impetal. Sound familiar? <laughs> Churchill describes the military challenge thus, and I will... I will uh, quote him if I can find the page which seems to have got confused here. Uh, the page has disappeared by an act of unbelievable, horrible, ghastly magic. This is, this is the 
worst nightmare that any lecturer can conceivably have because the bloody page has completely disappeared. This is uh, uh, extremely worrying. But what he had to say, said he, extemporizing rapidly and finding the page, is Churchill describes the military challenge of this campaign thus, and I quote, an absence of any strategic points, a well-armed enemy with great mobility and modern rifles who adopts guerrilla tactics. The results are that the troops can march anywhere and do anything except catch the enemy and that all their movements must be attended with loss. Sound familiar? Churchill goes on to say, as only a Victorian could, that civilization is face to face with militant Mohammedanism, which he saw as a global phenomenon running from the Ottoman Empire through Arab Sudan via the Emir of Afghanistan down through the Khyber Pass, carrying jihadi teachings from the madrasas of Cairo to the bazaars of Calcutta, to quote his own words. Does that sound familiar? In the end, <coughs> the British won the first three wars, but always with difficulty and without taming the country. In the first Afghan war, an entire British army was wiped out by the Pashtun, the worst disaster to befall British imperial arms until the Zulu victory in South Africa at Izandlawana in 1879. As you will recall, or not, as the case may be, made into a film called Zulu Dawn with the late, great Burt Lancaster. By then, Hollywood had already done the Northwest Frontier with a movie called King of the Khyber Rifles, starring a 1950s heartthrob, Tyrone Power. The Khyber Pass, by the way, was played by the Alabama Hills in Lone Pine, California. <laughs> I digress. NATO forces, ladies and gentlemen, in Afghanistan have been no more able to solve what Churchill called the riddle of the frontier than were their 19th and 20th century British predecessors. Or, for that matter, Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC. Churchill's riddle was that, though the Pashtun tribes had been disarmed, they had not been subdued. I quote him again. Their fanaticism, he said, remains unshaken. Their barbarism is unrelieved. And it is, of course, the descendants of Churchill's Pashtun tribesmen whom British and NATO forces have been fighting. And the modern version of Churchill's riddle is this. How do you translate military means into the achievement of lasting political ends delivered by agile diplomacy? In their Afghan wars, the British sought to impose rulers and then to hold them to tough terms set out in peace treaties. These rulers, foisted on the Afghans, mostly came to a sticky end once our armies had left. When we departed Afghanistan in 1842, after our first unhappy intervention, the ruler we had anointed, Shah Shuja, was soon assassinated. The Russians, more than a century later, had a similar experience. When they quit Afghanistan in 1989, they left behind President Najibullah, whose tortured corpse was to end up hanging from a Kabul traffic light. If you want to understand President Karzai's, today's president of Afghanistan, ambiguous view of his Western allies, it is that he does not want to suffer the fate of predecessors like Najibullah or Shah Shuja. There is, of course, no solution to Churchill's riddle. And that is the dilemma which has always confronted us in Afghanistan. In the beginning, in 2001, we sent troops to punish Al-Qaeda for 9-11. But somehow, a punitive expedition morphed into a poorly conceived project to rebuild Afghanistan in our own image. History should have taught us that to engage in social engineering in the name of a Western model of democracy was to play with Afghan fire. History should have taught us that the Pashtun tolerance for the presence of foreign forces was strictly limited, especially when those forces regularly slaughtered their family members. History should have taught us 
that our very military presence would become a recruiting sergeant, including in our own country, for the jihadists we were trying to suppress. History should have taught us that the training of an effective Afghan national army and police force is mission impossible against a background of illiteracy, poverty, and ethnic hostility, at least on any time scale tolerable to the American and British voter. And most important of all, history should have taught us that to put all our political eggs into President Karzai's basket is to repeat the old British mistake of picking rulers who are terminally compromised by their association with the cursed foreigner. The great 19th century Prussian strategist Clausewitz told us that war is the extension of politics by other means. War is futile if troops are deployed in a political and diplomatic vacuum, or if the political goal is unclear or unrealistic. So let's give the final word to a British officer, a veteran of the first campaign of 1839-42, who had this to say on the eve of the second Afghan war in 1878, and I quote him. A new generation has arisen, has arisen, which, instead of profiting from the solemn lessons of the past, is willing and eager to embroil us in the affairs of that turbulent and unhappy country. Although military disasters may be avoided and advanced now, however successful in a military point of view, would not fail to turn out to be as politically useless. Something to be pinned on the walls, I would have thought, of the White House, Downing Street, and the Elysee Palace, to name but three. Ladies and gentlemen, when Churchill was captured and imprisoned by the Boers in the South African War at the end of the 19th century, a fellow prisoner was a British army officer called Aylmer Haldane. Haldane was to emerge from the First World War as a general with a knighthood. In 1920, Lieutenant General Sir Aylmer Haldane marched into Mesopotamia, as Iraq was then known, at the head of a large force of British and Indian regulars backed up by Kurdish levies. As part of the peace settlement following the First World War, Britain had been awarded mandates by the newly created League of Nations to govern Mesopotamia and Palestine, and the French were given what is now Lebanon and Syria, one of the reasons why President Hollande is so keen to intervene in the latter. Haldane walked straight into a full-blooded insurrection, which was suppressed with some severity, including by the novel use of aerial bombardment. Like Churchill, Haldane wrote a memoir called The Insurrection in Mesopotamia, which you can download from the internet, and it's very, very interesting reading. It is full of interesting insights that were relevant to the 2003 Anglo-American invasion and occupation of Iraq. I know that Haldane's book was read by many Americans and British who were involved in Iraq, but that number did not include, to my knowledge, Downing Street or the White House, and more's the pity. Haldane says towards the end of his memoir that I regret that on my arrival in Mesopotamia, I was too much occupied with military matters and too little informed regarding the political problem. Now, Iraq, of course, is not Afghanistan, and Syria is different again. One of the problems of the 2003 invasion of Iraq was not the lack of a strategic political goal, as in Afghanistan, but one that was overly ambitious and wholly unrealistic. The fallacy of Tony Blair and the neocons was that Iraq was a natural candidate for Western-style democracy, where the spirit of Edmund Burke and the US founding fathers would blossom spontaneously. Casual reading of Haldane would have taught the lesson that, as desirable as it may have been to remove Saddam, and I was a supporter of the war, the dictator's disappearance would unleash ancient rivalries to be exacerbated by the creation of political parties based as they are today on religion and ethnicity. I see General Haldane and Winston Churchill too tearing out their hair on their celestial cloud above us. Richard, you mentioned the special relationship, so just let me say one or two words about this. 
Uh, some see the so-called special relationship between Britain and America fatally damaged by the recent vote of Parliament against Britain's military intervention in Syria alongside the US, as we then thought might happen imminently. I believe this to be untrue, but we should be far more clear-eyed about the nature of our relationship with this great country, the United States. And it is above all so important to separate reality from myth. The special relationship is actually a pretty recent thing. As Richard said, it is the creation of Winston Churchill, the greatest Anglo-American of them all. Its founding constitution is the Atlantic Charter, which he and President, uh, I thought he was up there, which he and President Roosevelt signed on the 14th of August, 1941. And that brief document sets out what soon came to be the joint war aims of the two countries. And they comprise principles that govern our relationship to this very day and the way we seek to behave in the wider world. And in putting his name to the charter, Churchill was something of a pioneer for telling the replacement of Britain by America as a global superpower. America remains our single most important partner and ally, as it has been for almost 70 years. We invest more in the United States than any other nation on Earth. The United States invests in the United Kingdom more than any other nation on God's Earth. There is little that the United States does or does not do that does not touch upon our national interest in some profound way. The supreme calling of the British ambassador in Washington is to influence the administration and Congress there's a difficult beast. <laughs> to do the things we want them to do and not to do the things that would be to our disadvantage as a nation. And it is as simple and as complicated as that. And we should not forget that Britain and America were not always so close. Besides, of course, the Revolutionary War and then the War of 1812, there were two or three times during the 19th century when we almost came to blows. The 1920s were also a very bad patch for the relationship, with an extraordinary period of naval rivalry, when Churchill himself was enraged by American negotiating tactics over a treaty to limit uh, naval armaments. Dean Acheson, President Truman's Secretary of State and the son of an English clergyman who had emigrated to America, was later to say with his characteristically sharp tongue, and I quote, a unique relation existed between Britain and America, but unique did not always mean affectionate. We had fought England as our enemy as often as we had fought by her side as an ally. Even since the Second World War, the relationship has had many ups and downs. Suez was a bad episode. So was Harold Wilson, not only refusing to send British troops to Vietnam, but smoking a pipe in the Oval Office to President Johnson's intense irritation. I witnessed some of these oscillations at first hand. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were a marriage made in heaven. But she got on less well with the older George Bush, who in turn got on very well with John Major. But Major did not get on terribly well with Bill Clinton, who was, of course, almost a brother to Tony Blair. And Blair himself, to the surprise of many, then went on to create the closest of relationships with the younger George Bush. And by all accounts, President Obama was less than impressed by Gordon Brown, who finally managed to corner him in a hotel kitchen in order to have a bilateral meeting which he could report to the British media. And I remember Battle of Britain Day in 1956. My stepfather was a station commander at the Royal Air Force Base at Duxford. The occasion was always marked by British, by, sorry, by a grand aerobatics display, first by venerable British meteor jets, and then by the ultra-modern sweat-wing American Super Sabres from one of the nearby US Air Force bases. The aerobatic style was very different. The meteors were slow-moving and balletic as they wheeled and swooped in the summer sky. The Americans announced themselves by hurtling towards us, low and loud from over the horizon. I jumped up and down with excitement. 
But I remember there was much sucking of teeth around me about the flashiness of Americans and their preference for show and brute force over skill. And this attitude finds its equal and opposite in, for example, something written by the American diplomat John Bolton in a recent book in which he opined that, and I quote, this is a good one, the Brits believed that their role in life was to play Athens to America's Rome, lending us the benefit of their superior suaveness and smoothing off of our regrettable colonial rough edges. I, I know John Bolton quite well, and when he says these things, he has a great bushy moustache, and it starts at almost a spin on his face. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, meteors versus super savers, British Greeks versus American Romans, Venus versus Mars, and even small, sweet, curly Caribbean bananas, favoured by Europeans, versus large, straight, coarse bananas from US plantations in Latin America, the antagonists in the ludicrous banana trade war of the late 90s between Europe and America. These competitive stereotypes will go on forever, and they are a sign of health, not disease. Now, I recount all of this not to disparage or belittle the relationship between Britain and America in any way at all. It is, after all, one of the great engines of the civilized world. But we must face the fact that our interests will not always coincide, and that each of our nations is duty-bound to uphold its own national interest, even if this means a row. The relationship is perfectly robust enough to absorb the occasional rough patch. But it does require hard work on both sides of the Atlantic if it is to, to, if it is to remain in rude health and to hold at bay those negative stereotypes. Benign neglect, any neglect, is not an option. The many flourishing trees, bushes, and plants of the Anglo-American garden seeded in large part by Churchill himself, demand constant tending, pruning, irrigating, fertilizing, as he used to do, and would no doubt wish us to do today. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many ways of honoring the memory of Winston Churchill. One of them is always to remember that we hold in trust for future generations a relationship which will through all the swirling tides of the 21st century, remain of inestimable benefit to the British and to the American peoples. So I congratulate the American Museum in Bath for its distinguished contribution to this most honorable and satisfying of tasks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.